drink of water, and then start again. Yeah, I'll just I might actually just sit like this <laughs> and talk and rub on my belly. It's a bit big. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, there's that. Hello. Okay, I'll go back to you. To you. It's all, the, all in the design of the chair has just saved collaboration. Yeah. Okay, um, so we, at Drupal Camp last year, I gave a talk about basic design principles, um, and the whole talk was uh, was very much about uh, contrast and, and actual specific design things. When I finished the talk, there was a girl there, and she put her hand up straight away. She had a question. She came to the talk for just so that she could speak to me and ask this question, and the question was, why don't designers use real content? She was a front-end designer, and she gets frustrated because a design comes to her and they haven't considered long titles and all those things. And I gave an answer which I still think is correct, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, but I kind of have spent this last year kind of fleshing it out a little bit more and thinking about actually why this might, why designers might not do that. Um, use real content and maybe realizing that the problem could be that maybe you don't know who designers are and what it is that they actually do in the, in the process of the job. Um, because I know, I, I know a lot of agencies that have actually, when it comes to giving the developer or the front end developer the work to do, the designs are done, you don't have a say in it, it's just make it. Um, and if you don't understand the process that's happened before, then that could cause some confusion as to um, frustrations as to why why they've done things the way they have if you don't necessarily understand the reasons. So we're going to look at who a designer is and what design actually means because I think that helps to cover this. Um, so there, there's lots of different types of designers um, in this web world. There's web design people that call themselves web designers visual designers, interaction designers, UX designers, uh, content strategists, researchers, uh, Drupal themers, um, there, what else is there? There's loads of other things. They just, new names pop up all the time. Um, and if you speak to any designer, they'll probably tell you that they specialize in one of these particular things. There's not very many people that are just web designer um, and can cover the whole broad spectrum of what design does. Um, so I really think that if you can find out your flavour of designer, the person you're working with, and know their strengths, then that can really help in your team. Um, I am a hybrid designer. Make that one up myself. Um, <laughs> because I basically, I've been a front-end dev for longer than I've been a web designer, but I came from a graphic design background. So I understand all the design principles. I've gone through print design and all these things. So I, I can explain why I've done something, and I can give the reasons and the arguments as to why something is why it is, the designer side of things, and I understand Drupal. I understand the complexities, the constraints, and I can see it from that side. So my design kind of comes from what Drupal can do through into the design and not the other way around. Because um, we've all worked with designers who don't understand Drupal and like to put things in awkward places that cause you weeks of headaches. Um, so, um, there's these labels in, in the world, and you know, there's like, developers are geeky, introverted people, don't like speaking to each other, and you know, can't talk to people whatsoever. And designers are extroverted people who wear dungarees and, um, <laughs> Bad choice of clothing, Justine. Um, and are free-spirited, and they, you know, they just prance around the place, um, and they, you know, don't follow the rules and things. Um, is that a true representation of developers, and is that a true representation of designers? No. It's similarities are there, but we all know developers that are loud and bubbly. We all know <laughs> designers that are quiet and shy. So I'm kind of 
kind of asking as well, because we've been doing this a lot in the Drupal world over the last few years, like paying a little bit more respect to people and, and really realizing that people have feelings. And like, designers have feelings too, you know? Um, <laughs> and, and we don't just play with crayons. And I think that um, you're kind of selling your designers short if you say, oh, you know, go off and play with your crayons in the corner. Because it might feel like that's what they're doing because you don't actually understand what it is that they do when they go away and are, are quiet for 10 minutes. Um, so I've kind of got an example of the key skills of a good designer. They're, they're a skilled professional person who are very analytical and they can be persuasive, they're obviously creative, and they've got good social skills. In your team of people, would you say that you personally, as a developer, feel that they're your strengths? So maybe a designer is quite good because you can balance each other out. Um, and a designer has to be able to present their work in a timely manner. They've got to meet these deadlines that... Um, clients put on them, um, and they have to be accountable. Why did you put that there? Because I like it is not good enough. Um, and if a designer ever says that to you, then just keep pushing until they actually give you an answer. And if they haven't given you an answer, it's quite likely you can change what they've done because they haven't been specific. Enough. There's no reasons and logic behind it. So if they just like it, then it's, it can be changed. I'll, I'll allow that. And if anyone wants to tweet abuse at me in a couple of months' time because their designer got angry at you, fine. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so as I'm saying, design is not self-expression, but what is it? Um, if you ask all the designers in the world what design is, every designer will give a different answer. Um, it's, uh, there's probably two points of view that I want to look at today. I might slip into a third because I could get into a bit of a rant about it. Um, but the first is, design is how we communicate what an object does or its function through its shape or form. So we're making a website, it's not a physical thing, it's not a chair or a table. So the website is that object. Um, but how many functions does a website have? Like how many modules does Drupal have? Um, there's not a specific function for a website and the whole the whole point of building this website is to find out the way that we can communicate to others, so um, what actions, so the design basically has to fulfill the task of saying, these are the actions that you can do on this website. You can do your tax return, you can fill out this form, you can buy a plane ticket. And it, that, the design has to make that clear. The other one is that design is a process we undertake to solve a problem. So how do we make people realize that they can buy a plane ticket? Um, do you remember when Apple made the phone covers for the phones because the antenna got in the way. So they like, quickly made an object to fix a problem. It's the, pretty much the same as that. It's just that websites, you tangibly be able to touch something makes it a lot easier than a website to explain. Um, so we're being asked to make a website for a reason and that reason is to normally solve an, a larger organizational problem and the website is obviously going to be only part of that. So there's fundraising and selling things, knowledge sharing. Um, charities don't get all of their donations through from the website, but the website is a very valuable part of it. Um, and when the designer comes in, the typical start of the design process is the discovery phase and that's when we'll look at the information um, and talk to the client, talk to users, talk to the people that edit the website. Like, there's no point in building a website for journalists if they can't upload, it on, uh, upload content on their phone, they can only do it uh, on a desktop and they, these are journalists that are out in the war zone somewhere. Um, and the biggest part of the discovery phase is actually changing what their problem, what, what the client said their problem is, into what their problem actually is. Uh, when you're on the inside of an organization, your problems can actually seem quite different to, to the reality of them. And that's what the designer's role is. They come in and kind of realize what these problems are, unpick them, you know, get a little bit 
um, Sherlock Holmes on it and, and understand the actual thing. Sometimes it's a technical problem, um, and then that's kind of straightforward. You just bring in the heavies, bring in the devs, and refix this problem. Or it's an internal actual processing problem. Um, if you've got a really complicated website with panels and crazy Drupal 7 stuff, um, and a high staff turnover because people are interns and they only stay for six months, and there's one person that's in charge of the whole thing, and she's on maternity leave, and there's no handbook on how to use the website. And, every, and this happens time and time again, and nobody understands how to use the website, but they had this million pound budget to get it done previously, but it's and it's a beautiful website, but nobody can use it properly, so it's slowly like getting degraded. So the problem here is we just need a simpler website to upload our content. And, and that could then be, become the focus of the project. So, um, so we kind of work on, on that basis of, of which things can be fixed or should be fixed and which things can we just kind of keep as they were. Uh, and that works the same through uh, information architecture and coming up with user stories to understand all the different uh, people that will use and uh, edit the website. Um, I like to come up with a motto to keep in my head for whilst I'm working on a project. Uh, recently I've done a site for climate change people and it's like, let the data do the talking was in my head constantly. And it's like, you're designing something, you get all carried away, and it's like, I'll have a drop down here, and I'll, I'll have a slidey thing come in here, and oh, I'll make it spin around there. And then it's like, oh, hold on, because now the data's like this size in, in my big monitor. I definitely need to remove some things and make the data do the talking. And that was what goes on in my head. Um, and, it, and I think that people should actually ask the designer, do you have a motto? What's the key phrase? And maybe come up with it in a team. What's the key phrase? for this project, what's the key goal that we're going to solve here? Um, and yeah, there's a lot going on. And sometimes there's teams of people doing this, sometimes it's just one of you. Um, and there's lots of meetings that happen in this discovery phase, and it actually eats up a lot of the budget. Um, hence, I used to work in quite a, a waterfall approach of development, where it was discovery, development, and then front end at the end kind of Make, sticking the two together and um, and there was no budget there ever and it was always come to me and it's like oh you want me to do all of this in two days oh yeah cool and, and the whole point is because they spent a lot of time at the beginning fixing the problem <coughs> finding out all of these things that are wrong which is wildly different to what the client said at the beginning in their RFP or, or whatever so yeah one of the first questions that a designer asks or in the kickoff meeting is asked is what does success look like? And this is where a designer won't use real content. Um, historically, we'd use flat designs, and I'm kind of glad Mark Comrie isn't here because he might kind of jump in and start saying, never use flat designs. And I kind of agree with him, like 97%, but there is 3% where if your designer is more comfortable designing flat designs and they don't have the time or the inclination to learn code, and they can explain to you their intentions, then let them do that. But I would recommend working with a front-end designer and working closer, a lot closer. Like, be there on their face, asking all the questions all the time. But, that, but generally, flat designs were used to sell to the client early on. You've just spent three months making um, all this discovery work and there's nothing to show for it and our clients bought a website and they want to see the designs so it, it was a logical step which we're now seeing is a silly mistake uh, a silly mistake to give people these flat designs and so soothe that impatience and, and kind of please the, the client early on um, but it doesn't work it doesn't tell the whole story it doesn't show the interactions the um, the way things are designed it, it leaves a design open to a lot of interpretation. And then this is where I say go and check out Mark's talk because he explains it so much better. And it is completely a whole other talk in itself. Um, that, that you're designing for humans and not for browsers. Um, so get on to that. So, so yeah, so the whole point of these flat designs is that you're selling this vision. And if you're not doing flat designs, then what do you sell them? 
you can tell them mood boards, you can tell them um, feels, we're working on this, here's an element that is going to fix this duration problem that you've got. It's going to be like this and it's going to move this way and, and it's going to look like this website in a way that it's going to make you feel the same way, but it's going to work as fast as this one. And as long as you can get the designer to talk to the client about it in that respect, then, then the client's still going to be happy. They're going to be soothed enough to see what's going on. And, and keeping the clients involved in the process works. But this is still only happening in a really short space of time, and the client's still got to provide you guys with something to use. Um, so they're trying to soothe this return of investment for the client. They're trying to get something so that you can actually see what you're doing. And yeah, and the, and the component-driven design really kind of helps that. Um, and also, it helps with your accessibility budgets because if you can sell earlier on that you're building for human beings and not for browsers, then you can say a lot. You know, you can really focus in on we're building for human beings from the beginning, and this is why we need to keep our accessibility budget. Please don't burn it on something else. Um, but the uh, so the kind of things that we've had to think about is mobile first, content out, component driven design, which is accessible, meets the business needs of the client. So that's like a human centered, accessible, responsive content out approach. Um, that, that's all going on in the designer's head when they're coming up with these things. So. If they miss the fact that a H1 is, doesn't quite work on three lines, you know, just tell them. Because it's not such a big deal, really, because they've had to do all of that other stuff first. Um, so, yeah, and they might also be learning HTML and CSS themselves. So that's learning to code and do the thing that they already do and kind of keep up with their targets and deadlines. Um, and if they're like me, they're going to get lost down a rabbit hole of like code pen wanting to find a nice animation to just do a little hover effect and you know, never see them for weeks because, oh, it's not quite right, let's try this one. Um, it happens. It's not going to not happen. Um, so, yeah, it is understandable that little things like that are going to be forgotten. But I think that's where the front-end developer comes in. And this is why I said when uh, the lady asked the question last year. It is down to the front end developer to do this, even though they have to do check that, that you know we're still on track for the user journeys, that the accessibility is fine, the performance is okay, that it works in all the damn browsers, uh, that it's refactored any of the crazy code that I've written in ten minutes just to get something over to the client, because um, you know it's just CSS. That's all the front enders do, right? Um, uh, just CSS. I really hate it when people say that. Um, but yeah, it, so the designer and the front ender should completely be talking all the time, and the front ender should be talking to the developer all the time. I kind of consider a front end developer to be a translator. They are they they can talk to the logical brain of a of a developer and the creative brain of a designer, and they can interpret the two. You should always be hearing front end devs saying things like, "The dev says this is quite hard. I've seen what they mean." Could we do it this way? And then, ideally, the de designer will go, yes, that way works just as well. Make sure this is to that side or over here or big enough text because we need to consider blah, blah, blah. Perfect conversation. Probably never, ever happens, but it is the kind of conversations that should be happening. Actually, it does happen. It happened to me the other day at work, and I felt a little bit excited. Um, <laughs> I was like, yes, it's working. Um, yeah, um, good old Andy. He's like, he's an intern, so I can mould him. Um, uh, <laughs> teaching them right. Um, yeah, so if you don't have a front-end dev, what do you do? Um, because you don't have that translator. And I think this is, is actually a key factor. If you've got somebody who can talk technical and understand creative, then you are combining those two worlds and, it, and it, they do merge better. But I don't really understand solar, I don't really get half of these things, but I understand that I'm making a search engine thing, right? I get it, and I need a search button. Um, but have, I've, I've sat in rooms with some devs and been a bit like, and I've been sat in rooms with some creative people and been like, oh my gosh, like, calm it down. And if you two are talking together, 
then you're passionate about your own separate things and not understanding that the other person doesn't understand the words that you're saying. Um, so no good designer will understand how complicated it is to do one small thing. So show them. Like, just pull the designer over and say, this is what you want me to make. This is how it comes out of the box. To do that, it's going to take me 12 hours. It's going to take me this long, it's whatever. Um, we can do this. We can use these facets, and it does it this way. That's already there, and I can just change it. Is that okay to do that? A designer will very likely say, yes, that's fine. I didn't know it could do that if I thought that was going to be difficult because they just don't understand the complexity of it. And just the same way from the developer's point of view, why, why have you made the design like that? Why is it using 12 different colours? I don't need to use 12, can we just use 6? If the designer can tell you why they've used 12, oh, well, I'd like to speak to them. Uh, but um, <laughs> <laughs> Where is Invictus? Um, yeah, so if, it, if you need to use 12 colours and there's a reason for it, then cool, then you have to understand the reason for it is because the user needs it, uh, because those 12 different colours might represent 12 different sections of the website. And have you picked up on that yet? No, you haven't picked up on it, so does the user do it? So does it work properly? So ask these questions back to your designer because it might be that they haven't quite got something right and you're there to help in that process to make it right. You are part of it. Um, so this back and forth conversation obviously works really well and... Um, yeah, like I said earlier, if they can't back anything up, then it's quite likely you can change it. Have that conversation with your dev, um, with your designer. So, your designer is busy away doing its human-centered, accessible, responsive, content-driven design, and you're both talking to each other. You're on the right track. Um, but there's a few areas that your designer could need help with, especially these days with component-driven design, because they're learning a new thing. Um, Pattern Lab seems to be what everyone's talking about. There was, should have been two talks about it this week, yeah. weekend. Um, sure. Yeah, there should have been two talks about it this weekend. And um, it's, pretty, it's a pretty new tool, really. It's been around for a while, but it's really just started to get the traction going. And um, your designer's got to learn to get to grips with that. And there's, there's this guy in Pattern Lab called Jason. Now, I don't know who Jason is, but he's a whole new language. Um, <laughs> My project manager is French, and she calls him Jason all the time, and I quite like it. Uh, yeah, so, so Jason and Jason files. I had never really had to deal with these before until um, Jason until Pattern Lab came about, and it was a bit like, well, how do I do this? I, I can just nest all these things in these brackets, and it all kind of appears, and it kind of looks like this new twig thing I've got to do. So it's kind of working, but I don't really understand it. And for any dev out there, it's like, oh, just move it over there, Justine. Seriously, like. It's that simple. So talk and ask them if there's anything they can do um, with it. Um, last year at Frontline United, Dan Maul was there, and he talked about using JSON. And I rolled my eyes, and I was like, don't give your designers another layer of things to do. They're already doing this human-driven content design thing. Um, let's not give them another language to learn as well. Um, I think I was wrong. I think that JSON is actually a really good call. Um, and the, getting the whole team inv involved earlier is something that I'm trying to do um, at Code Enigma. So we've, we've got to the stage when the wireframes are built, and then we turn around and go, right, we need to name these things. We need to make these JSON files to make these Pattern Lab components. So we all sit down, and we all go through the wireframes, and we look at what each element is and how long they are. And should this be a field, like a, a text field, do we call it stand first or introduction, do we call it this? And, and we, together as a team, come up with the names for these JSON files. So at this point, the dev already has a pretty clear idea of what he's building, even though he hasn't seen the design, because the designer has no idea yet either. Um, well, hopefully a little idea. Um, so we're already kind of building the, these, we're further along the wireframe structure already, because we, we, can, we can flesh out a website at this point. The, designer can, uh, the developer can go and get started, really. They know all the fields and things that they need to build. Um, and actually, I was really lucky. I was having a rant in our IRC channel, because we're so cool, we still use IRC. And um, I definitely work with a bunch of devs. Um, and <laughs> 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 um, 
I'm just a slack. No. Um, I was having a bit of a rant, and I was like, oh, it'd be really good if we could just scrape this website that we're rebuilding and like just spit it out in a whole load of JSON files for me, because then I can just use real content, and then I don't have to make it up. And um, it got made for me. <laughs> Like, the next day I came to work and um, the CTO was like, oh, I made you a thing, I've called it JSON Populate. Basically, you just, like, load some files and click some buttons, because you designers like that, thanks. And there you go. And I'm like, ah. And um, it doesn't really look like much right now. It makes me giggle a bit, because it's quite fun. But basically, um, you just make a whole load of JSON files and fill out the film. So we do that in our wireframing session. Uh, uh, well, wire naming session. And um, and then just add a whole load of key pages. And normally you can get these page, this list of key pages, like exemplar content uh, from the client, like which is your favorite, you know, the best example of a events page, of this page, of that page, and go in and see. Well, that one's got a long title. This one's got a short title. Take three or four component, like sample pages, and add them to this list in JSON Populate. It's a YAML file, and then fire up some server in something, I always get the wrong folder, uh, and then have to get someone to fix it for me. But um, fire up the server, and then basically I can click anywhere. Can you just about see where it says meet the team on this side? It's a little bit greened out. Click on that, and then click on any of the fields, because this is the fields of the JSON file, and I can pick whatever part of the, of the message that I want. So for the button URL, I want to keep the the URL and not the wording. That's pretty cool. That fills that out for me straight away. It updates in Pattern Lab and I've got real content. Um, so this is this is a bit of a win. Um, we've released this to our GitLab repository so you can use it if you want to. Um, things will break because it's just like the first run of it all. Um, obviously contributions are, and suggestions are welcome. But this has actually worked pretty well for me getting a little bit closer to real content because we can start modeling things a lot earlier on because we've got a wider range of sample content to start with. So designers do use real content. Um, and, and we're getting somewhere with that. And I think that this could be like the missing element of Pattern Lab, uh, like the, the, the almost like the nuclear element of it, um, of atomic design because there's the content before the elements. Um, so, yeah, who really are designers? Me and you, you've all got to say, have the say. The design process doesn't stop when it leaves the designer's hand. It keeps going. You have an opinion, use it, say it. Um, and I definitely think that that's part of it, um, that you should feel empowered to say to your designer, I think this is wrong, or I don't understand why this works. And no design designer will, should be angry with you because of that, because it is their job, as we said earlier, it is their job to get this feedback from people and to make all these iterations. So, so tell them if you think that they're wrong. Um, and the reason why you get some short content titles or some text that doesn't quite make sense or they haven't considered what happens if there's not an image or if there is an image, well, that is just an optimal design to sell it to the client. That's just one flavor of all the billions of pages that could happen in your website. So ask the questions about these things and it'll come together. And um, design is the plan that gets us to our goal. It is not the end game. You know, you are still the, the team players in the, the sport of design. Um, so why don't designers use real content? Well, they do, they can, optimal content for how the design should look when success has happened is there, and the crappy content is there, and we don't design all the pages because we'll never be finished. Uh, we're not making a book. Um, Today, the best designers aren't coming from a single designer. The best designers aren't coming from a single designer who somehow produces an amazing solution. The best designers are coming from teams that work together as a unit, marching towards a commonly held vision and always building a new understanding of the problem. And that's from Jared Spool in a redesign of the design process um, article 
And I think that pretty much summed up everything I was trying to say in that time. Um, and his, there we go, that's the URL for that, so articles.ie.com. And a lot of this other work is, a lot of my other thinking has come from a book called You're My Favourite Client. And um, even if you're a, d a developer or a project manager or something, I really recommend this book. I think it kind of, it works in a way of how to get the client to understand what you are doing and also how to get a developer to understand what design is doing. And I think that it's really well written and a lot better than how I spoke for the last 20 minutes. So, um, yeah, they're, they're my two recommendations books if you want to read more about that. And I am done. Any questions? percent of the time. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yes. I actually have not come by a lot of projects where we migrate from Google Sites to Google Sites. So the Google content is definitely there. Yeah. Um, we often also end up like migrating the, the, con the content that we want to first track. Yeah. So we're always a little tight with the content. Exactly. Just keep going back. Yeah, I know that you will keep going back to them. <laughs> like just keep, just keep going back to them. I think that's the thing. Like some designers just, I, uh, that's working with the wrong flavour of designer. Really, that's probably a designer who's spent a lot of their time doing print work, um, or working in an advertising agency or something like that. You might find that another designer won't give you back Laura and Mipson. They will. They won't concentrate on making a pretty picture. They're they're not as visual. They're more problem solving. Advertising is really good. Um, you might have noticed all my slides were Mad Men slides because advertising is really good at selling a dream and that is just pretty pictures to influence your brain whereas web design is more solving the problem. Um, so a different type, a different flavour of designer probably would make your life a bit easier. <laughs> um, but yeah, completely agree with doing the migration first because that's almost the same as the JSON populate tool because it's getting in that real content into the designer's hands as early as possible really um, that's so beneficial cool oh yeah so if your client comes with, with their own designer who's made their kids yeah designer, how are you like, what's your advice then to run no um <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, you can still have that conversation. Like, it doesn't matter if it's the client's designer. They should still be able to hold, withhold their argument as to why something is like it is. And if you can say, but have you thought about the fact that these are green and red links? Um, have you, you know, it, say, it's my job to pick up on this too. Um, and I'm concerned about this. Can you tell me why you've done it? They should be able to come back with a valid reason. And yeah until they can't come back with a valid reason, then you just keep arguing that point, I think. It's the only way. The communication just helps resolve the problems. And yeah, it doesn't matter if it's a client's designer because you should still be able to talk the same way. You're not slinging mud at them, you know. <laughs> it's still, it should still, still a professional conversation, so yeah. Cool, oh, hello. Oh. Tie their hands. No. <laughs> so the context for that is um, that uh, I've worked with a bunch of projects which were designed first and they wouldn't get signed off and it was a hard deal to yeah. And then uh, and I'm lucky enough in my last job to get to a point where we could say, no, we're gonna build first. Yeah. And we're gonna migrate first and then have all of that content and then design it into later. But there's always that point where the moment of design gets involved and because through no fault of the designer, people start expecting yeah. And yeah. once you see a design, then it becomes a specification of yeah. what you want them to do. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that is just completely getting the whole team started earlier because everybody at that table has a different opinion. The designer is there with that like with that brain to, to solve that problem, to almost method act 
put themselves into all of those user journeys that have been created and be like, oh yes, but you know, I, I'm, I'm a mother of three and I've just got a small baby and I need to quickly do this on my phone, so I need to make these buttons big. You know, a designer's going to just jump into that role and be like, oh yeah, you know, so I can't put the button at the top because these new phones are massive, so we'll put the button on the bottom. And, um, and that, that knowledge is really great and really useful, but it means that a developer has to be at the table to go, yeah, but could we put the button in the middle because that makes life a whole lot easier for everyone. And this button isn't that important and it shouldn't take a whole week's worth of budget up. So let's play. So it is, it, again, it's communication, isn't it? It's getting them in and saying, let's, and component-driven design as well, that really helps because it's like, focus on this bit. Let's, let's, let's nail this one thing. Let's nail these important segments and then so like embellish. Yes, give them a distraction. Yeah, and yeah, because that, that, that soothes that need for, oh, we've bought a new website, we want to see it now, we need to know what it is. Yeah. Because it's like, well, you told us that your donations are really bad and this is what we're here to fix. So this is your new don donation splash page. This is the, this is the function where it's preset to all these different numbers so that people don't have to put in key values. You know, show, show them this. This is how we're going to improve your donations. Um, and then that keeps the designer happy because they've got their creative fingers in something. That keeps you guys happy because you've solved a nice technical problem and the designer's also got something, um, and the client's got something wonderful to see that makes them realize that you understand them. Yeah. Cool. Anyone else? Hello. Time consuming. Yep, yeah, you do. Build them the JSON files. Say these are the fields that you've got to work with. That's a good start. Um, because then it's almost like you're giving them a, a Lego set and say, build something fancy. That, you know, they can go on for it ages with that. <laughs> um, but it's the same approach, isn't it? You're still working from build and then design in that way. Um, if you can do that. Give them the JSON, just a JSON file is not going to take you long to whip up if you know what the keys, some key values are. Start working from here and then, yeah, that, that could probably help um, because they can still do that in a flat approach because it's like, this is, the JSON file can say, this is a field, it's a long text field, this is a this, this is a that. These are all the elements that you have to play with on this page. Go to Photoshop and enjoy it. Yeah, I think that, I think that works. Hello. Yeah, cool. Yeah. It's um so it's completely working atomically, so you start at those no smaller basic elements and, and adding it upwards. Have you read all the Brad Frost things on it? Because it's the same principle really. Once you've got all of those basic elements in, it is a case of just reusing those and adding them up. So you shouldn't, if you've done it right, have too many variables. You shouldn't be adding new things when you get to the components layer or templates because you should be reusing what's back there. So it should, should be consistent. And if it isn't, then maybe somebody's adding some sneaky fun in the middle. I know. <laughs> some sneaky fun, yeah. Some purple and pink, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that that could be the problem there, that there's maybe too many variations at the beginning, too much to choose from. Really narrow that down. Like, I, I always find a really good rule for design is like, take stuff away until it's broken. Because if, if instead of adding more shinies, don't take shinies away until it, until it just works. And then you've got a really clear, really easy to use website that doesn't have anything it shouldn't have. Um, you know, that was like one of my little design mantras. And I think it sounds like you've got someone who likes to add all the colours and all the fancy bits, and then you get things that jar each other. Um, I think it's more of a I'm Yeah, I like doing this, my favourite <laughs> game. <laughs> Three days a week, I'm like that. <laughs>
But then I think then in that case you should actually say that is fine. We can change that here, but it does mean that we're going to change it there as well because they then become so distant, and, then, and the the contrast between these two means that the site isn't coherent anymore. It's not one unit. So the implication of us changing this here means it's actually a little bit more work than you think it is. Um, and I, I think a client, if it's important enough, they'll do it, and all they'll see is the expense in it and be like, oh, no, don't worry about it. So, yeah, it's, again, I'll have that conversation. Cool. We're done. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so hungry. Like, oh. Well, we never know if I should turn it off or not. I'm just going to leave it. We're not going to play with the technology. Just put the cables on. Yeah, pull it all out. You're like, she's ranting. Yeah, she's talking rubbish again. Yeah, I'm going to push it. <laughs> Doodles board. I understand. Oh, it was ranty. Uh, no, not too much. Feels like, oh. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Yeah, you do have a Go say. A bit more. Yeah, yeah. I think that um, essentially everyone wants to build a nicer website and and to do a good job. So the back and forth is actually going to make it that yeah. little bit nicer. Yes, I've been they, there. They, they I've literally been there. there. <laughs> They're not even at the company <laughs> anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can't. I can't figure out what you're talking about. <laughs> Yeah, you're just working from a spreadsheet. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah, I think, yeah. But this, is where, but this is where all this has come from. Like, there just hasn't been enough back and forth in certain places. And that, that actually would be really beneficial and the project would go a bit smoother if that happened. Yeah, definitely. No worries. Thank you very much for coming. Hello. I haven't seen you for a while. Probably a year. Yeah, normally, normally the case, isn't it? Uh, how are you, Jeff? Good. You're hungover because it's Sunday. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Um, he said Mark stopped, was it? Around uh, flat design. Mark, Mark stock, Mark, Mark flat design, Photoshop, what, when? Uh, yeah, what? Oh. Uh, Jared Spool, the last two things at the end. No? no, no? no. Right in the middle. Oh, Brad Frost. Brad Frost. Brad Frost, Atomic Design, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. That's a really good. Um, was that in the middle? Did I say There's another one you oh, dropped well. <laughs> <laughs> no, Brad was Frost was the no, question. Was another one you dropped in. Um, oh, man. Mark, I thought it was Mark Stock or Mark Storm or Mark something. But maybe I was, I mean, look, I wasn't listening properly. I wasn't listening properly. Man, what did I say? I oh, I was mid rant, yeah. Oh, I think I probably just said it wrong. I, yeah, I think I probably meant Mike again, because a lot of things have come from that Mike Montero book. Okay, no, yeah. It wasn't, wasn't that one. Surname. Yeah, I didn't say, I wouldn't have said his surname. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> yeah, who knows? <laughs> Let me go through my slides. <laughs> no, but I'll have rant it. I've mid-rant, right, so I might be prompted. You were definitely mid-rant. That's <sighs> why so I shouldn't rant. I as you were talking, I couldn't find his name or anything. What was I staring at? <laughs> <laughs> what was I staring at when I was looking at it? What was that? It's like porn. Yeah, it's probably. What is design? Yeah, that is quite likely. Mind you, Different every points single of view. word has got, every one has got design in it, so I'm going to get. <laughs> Something to do with design, yeah. It's almost like that's what the talk was about. Um, <laughs> damn it. Damn it, I was in the wrong room. <laughs> yeah, go on, out you go. Um, oh, what would it have been? I've never written this much stuff and left it in my notes before I got so lost at some points. Normally it's just like wor one word. 
Um, yeah, okay. Oh, man, what's it's it's one of those things where you can't I've done that where I've had done talks. Oh, Mark moment. Conroy's talk. Do, Conroy. Mark Conroy, the it. Drupal guy, yeah. Okay. Oh, there we go. Eye. Yes, he should have been here this weekend, but he's Irish. Uh, he does a lot of Pattern Lab. Um, Sorry, but he's Irish. But he's Irish. <laughs> but, he <lives> in, <laughs> but he lives in Ireland, and he's been snowed in. Oh, oh I see. <laughs> completely different. Oh, that's completely different, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. Uh, how well does my crown look? Yeah. <laughs> er really, really, sorry, Mark. <laughs> yeah, but go listen to his talk. Cause, uh, yeah, that's right there. Oh. Are you guys up to now? Uh, it's coffee now, isn't it? Yeah. It is. And then I'm going to watch Jenny's tasty back end Drupal 8, I think. I like half an hour. quite like that one. Yeah. I've never seen that talk, so I'm going to sit in on her talk this afternoon. Did you see the keynote this morning? No. Oh, they did. Like the JP yeah, thing. Oh, cool. Oh. And and did you twitch? Like, oh, oh. <laughs> do a little dance. Yeah, get my camera up. Because people say, "What have you worked on?" It's still one of my first answers. That's like, yeah. lots of things went into that. Yeah, yeah give them fear a little bit. There. <laughs> And I've got, I think because that lady said about like having funny lips all the way through, I was like, <laughs> 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 so when we were with Fat Hint, like, we were talking about the microphone.